I didn't actually bring my notes from the hydrology review, but did anyone happen to have any questions from anything they looked at? If you looked at any of the practice examples or anything like that from last Thursday? If not, no, I, I, um, just in case you did, I could answer questions potentially. I didn't bring the notes for that. I didn't bring the solutions. All right. So what I want to do today, similar to last time, I've got some notes, and hopefully everyone had a chance to either at least look at it or print out some of the stuff. Um, I want to go over some notes and then do again do some practice example um, or practice problems. The hydraulics section is is a little more it's a little more challenging relative to um, doing practice problems, and you'll you'll see when we do a couple of them. One of the keys for the hydraulics, I guess it's similar to the hydrology, there are lots of tables out there that have like loss coefficients for pipe fittings and different ways to calculate head loss in a pipe in terms of uh, one method we'll talk about is a, you know, you get a minor loss and you multiply it by the velocity head and you can es estimate the head loss through a fitting. There is another method where you just say the fitting and it kind of approximates a head, uh, an equivalent length of pipe for that fitting. So if you go through a fitting, there's a head loss. If you went down, so a fitting might have a head loss of 0.2 feet. So what they do is they take that 0.2 feet of head loss and they convert it into a length of pipe. So a fitting would be, you know, 0.2 feet of head loss, doing it the one way, or it'd be equal to having like another 25 feet of pipe. So there's sort of two ways to do head loss, and we'll talk about it. But the, the problem with it, or not the problem, more the challenge for you guys, when you're in the exam, hydraulics has a lot more, what I would say, reference tables that can be used to do the problems. And I'll, I'll specifically show you one example on a problem today. Um, you know, if you have a pipe that's flowing full, you can calculate the answer a certain way. If the pipe's not flowing full, it gets more, cal more complicated to do the geometry and make all the calculations because it's, you know, it's not a circle anymore. It's some sort of partial circle flow. And so there are tables that you could just sort of pull off these ratios and like get the answer from. Um, but if you don't have the tables, a very simple problem can become a very hard problem because it's now geometry, not really hydraulics. Um, so I'll try to highlight that. But the key is, again, with your reference material, Tables of atmospheric properties, uh, vapor pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, things that pressure, uh, density of water, how it changes with temperature. You know, there's some tables that you may not really be thinking about, and we'll see them in a couple of our sample problems. If you don't have those tables, I don't know how you would do some of the problems, because they're not going to give you those tables. Um, all right. So let's first, again, we'll run through the these notes and then we'll get into the sample problems. Oh, thanks. Anybody not sign this? All right, so a big one, uh, water pressure. And again, I'll just kind of go through the these couple pages and notes. Uh, pressure. The way we think about it is gamma H. This is the specific weight of water. And this is the the height of the fluid. So the Typically, we have this in feet, and this is pounds per cubic feet or something like that. That works out to be a pressure. Um, uh, another relationship that's really useful is a specific weight is density times gravity. So this is density. And so again, depending on the problem, depending on the reference tables that you have, Maybe they give you the density of the fluid, and they want you to know something about pressure. So this simple equation, this is just gravity, G. Um, if you have the density, you could calculate the specific weight to go up here and get a pressure. So it kind of depends. Like This is used a lot to go back and forth between density and specific weight, because we typically want specific weight. But again, sometimes they're reporting things with densities. And so this is the relationship to get from density to the specific weight. Um, and another thing, so I'm saying, you know, if we're talking about water, 
the pressure head, um, well, that's a, this is pressure, not pressure head yet. This is related to the specific weight of water and the height of that, if I would call it water. Sometimes they also talk about this, we're not dealing with water, we're dealing with gas, gasoline, um, or some, some form of gasoline, and or oil, or something like mercury. So we get into these manometer problems where we have something lighter than water, be like gas, or we have something heavier than water, like mercury. This relationship works for any fluid. It's just the specific weight of that fluid and the height of that fluid. So you can always calculate a pressure in a fluid with this equation. A lot of the times we're using water, so we're dealing with water. So the specific weight of water, I shouldn't have put water there, just to make it more general. But again, if you give me, you tell me you've got eight inches of mercury, I could calculate the pressure you know, due to that mercury with this equation, with this, this is the specific weight of mercury. Um, um, again, that's on the first page. And another thing that we, you often see is uh, this S unit, and I'll just put SX is equal to um, the specific gravity. And you can think of this as, what? Well, S, X is equal to specific weight of X over the specific weight of water. So S is a dimensionless term, the specific gravity. So sometimes they'll tell you you have a fluid that has a specific gravity of 0.8, or I guess mercury is like 13.6. So they're giving you this. You should be able to get this from a table or know what it is, generally speaking, did I write down a number? Yeah. It's usually 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And with this relationship, you could get the specific weight of that fluid to use it to calculate a pressure or whatever you're doing. So this equation is useful for getting from density to the specific weight. This relationship, if they give you a specific gravity, you have to know that it's relative to the specific weight of water and you can calculate the specific weight of whatever it is they're talking about, okay? All right, that's what that stuff is. And then just another, it's subtle, but I'm gonna say pressure in absolute units is equal to P, I'll say gauge units, plus P atmosphere. And sometimes they'll call this like PSI, and this would be like PSIA. So just pay attention to, in, in the atmosphere would be, you know, typically this is something like, you know, if you're at sea level, 14.7 PSI. So the idea here is if you have a pressure gauge tapped into something, and the gauge is just out in the atmosphere, right? So it's connected to a pipe, and the atmosphere is around the gauge, and the gauge reads 10, this is, if, that's fine if you're gonna deal with gauge units, it's 10 PSI. Inside the pipe is 10 PSI. If they're asking you for absolute pressure units, you just have to remember that gauge did not count atmosphere. So if you needed absolute pressure, for whatever reason, you would have to get the atmospheric pressure add it to the gauge pressure, and then you would have absolute pressure in the pipe. So just be on the lookout for absolute pressure. If a problem says absolute pressure, you're probably gonna have to do something like this um, to get a gauge pressure to be absolute pressure. Um, all right. Again, that's just a little background on um, some fundamental properties. And then just the other thing I have, I want if we do, I'm gonna have a pipe. And we'll have a datum. And so if I go to the center of a pipe, I go to the center of a pipe, I'm gonna call this Z1. Z2, and I'm going to go to here. Uh, 
And this is going to be alpha V1 squared over 2G. This is going to be P1 over gamma. Um, and let's go here. And this is going to be my head loss. P2 over gamma, V alpha, E2 squared over 2G. So this is just our hydraulic grade line. So this is our energy grade line. Well, I'll say this is our energy grade line without head loss. And this is with head loss. So sometimes we can neglect head loss for whatever reason. Um, but in this scenario, my drawing's not great. V this is a pipe of constant diameter, and we'll get into some more basics for, for fluid stuff. But the velocity here is the same as the velocity here, right? Because same diameter, there's no way velocity can change. It's flows going through a pipe. So it's 10 feet per second here, it's 10 feet per second here. So V squared over 2G, V squared over 2G are the same numbers, same value, because the velocity is the same. Because Z1 is bigger than Z2, you, my drawing doesn't really reflect this, P2 is different than P1. So if you have a, a pipe that's sloped, that's a constant diameter, your velocity is going to be the same all along the pipe, so V squared over 2G is going to be the same all along the pipe. But as you change elevation, your pressure has to compensate for the change in elevation to get back up and balance your energy. So what, I don't know if you remember, um, I'll just say uh, P over gamma plus Z plus V squared over 2G. This is our energy. Um, this would be our, our, you know, how we would do our various grade lines. Um, we'll do some problems with this. This is how we would write an equation. And you'll, we're going to do some sample problems with this. But I can write this equation. If this is 1 and this is 2, how many of you happen to remember Bernoulli's equation? Does Bernoulli sound familiar at all? So fluid mechanics. You had to have talked about fluid or, uh, Bernoulli's equation. And so what's nice about that is I can go from one location to another location along a flow line. So water's flowing along this line, right? And I can write, essentially break out the Bernoulli's equation, and I can say that P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G is equal to P2 over gamma plus uh, Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G, and I can add my head loss from 1 to 2. That's, a, that's essentially the, what we call the energy equation. It's based on Bernoulli's equation, and if you remember, Bernoulli's equation actually didn't include head loss. So basically we call this the energy equation when we add the head loss term into it. So it's just saying that energy at location 1 is equal to the energy at location 2, plus whatever head loss occurred from one to two. So it's conservation of energy. And where you're gonna see this problem, and again, this can be in the, now who asked about the AM practice questions? So I, the, the handout that I gave you, if you page through it, some of the pages don't really say, there are some AM questions in there as well. Yeah, so they're all kind of mixed together. Um, but when you start looking at the problems, where this will come into play, is they're going to give you just enough that you'll know everything in here except like one thing. Like maybe you don't know V2, but they'll, they'll tell you some of this stuff, they'll tell you some of this stuff. If you use the energy equation, write this out, you could start plugging in what you know and then v, you could solve this for V2. And then if you know the diameter, you can calculate the discharge. So they'll give you just enough 
to solve this equation, to, to figure out what you don't know or what you need to calculate discharge or velocity. Most of the time, they're looking for discharge or velocity. Sometimes they want you to figure out the head loss. Um, uh, and we'll do some problems with that. I didn't include it, but if you have my handout, you see how I have an alpha here and an alpha here. I didn't even write it over here. Most of the time, we assume alpha is 1. The review manuals show an alpha in the equation sometimes, so I stuck it in there. The sample problems, I don't recall seeing a sample problem where I had to use an alpha. Um, so that's why I wrote the equation like that. Alpha just is a, it's a measure that's very close to 1 if you would actually use it. And it's just due to, you know, if I have a pipe and I look at the velocity profile, right here and right here, the velocity is close to 0. Like right at the surface of the pipe, there's a velocity point that's 0. We typically talk about average velocities across the pipe diameter, and that's the number that you would be using here. If you have a very large pipe or very unique pipe, this profile can get a little more exaggerated. And alpha, I show you there's a way to calculate alpha, but you'd never have enough information to calculate it. Alpha could change, and you could include it in here, and it just counts for the fact that it's not a constant velocity across the pipe. Most of the time, alpha is 1, and it doesn't even show up in the equation. But some reference manuals have it, so I included it there just so you potentially would know what I was talking about. Um, and another thing with, and I think I'm going to do one problem with this too. This is really useful. If we have a pipe, and I stick in a pitot tube, So basically, it's a pipe. I can tap through the pipe, and then this pipe comes in and goes to a small opening. And I could call this one, and this is going to go to a standing water, and I can call that two. So why this is useful is if, and typically for pipes, we do center line. So if you gave me H for a flowing pipe, I can actually calculate the velocity, or I can calculate whatever I want to. So let's think of this equation for a pitot tube setup. P1 over gamma is there, OK? Z1, let's make that 0, because we're going to use units of H. So I'm going to make that 0. I'm going to make Z2 H. I'm going to go from here to here. So my z is going to be 0 to h. So z1 is 0, z2 is h. What the, and this is the, this is the, and I'm not going to have any head loss because this is a very small unit. The velocity at point 1, so if I took a pipe and I curved it and I stuck it right in, into the flow, this is the main assumption you have to just remember with the pitot tube and the only way we could do this problem. The velocity at point 1 is 0. Because what it's saying is, you have flow coming in. The pressure has pushed the flow up to this level, and that is now static. It's not moving. So all of this water is not moving, which means right in front of the entrance, there's no way water can move. There's a point, the stagnation point right in the front is a 0 velocity. The water's going around it, but right at that point, the stagnation point, there's 0 velocity. So V1 squared over 2G is 0. That's the, that's the main assumption of this pitot tube setup. And if you don't make that assumption, you can't work out the math. All right, so V1 over 2, or V1 squared over 2G is 0. What, what's the velocity at point 2? 0, because it's, again, it's a static surface. So that's 0. Um, What's the pressure at point 2? I didn't draw this very well, but it's open to the atmosphere. And most of the time, we're dealing with relative units, relative to atmosphere. So the pressure at point 2 is 0 relative to atmosphere. So this is 0. And so now, P1 over gamma is equal to H. And you can calculate the pressure in the pipe. So this is a really, you know, this is kind of old school device. 
Um, but again, if you stick a pitot tube in a pipe, you measure the height. The height is essentially giving you the pressure in the pipe. Or, you know, again, you could plug a gauge in there, tap the pipe, screw in a gauge. The gauge would read a pressure. It's essentially operating the same way. The gauge is reading the, sort of the pressure of that water that's trying to push up into the gauge. Um, and I've, I've seen some problems, AM problems and PM problems that get more involved that are essentially this pitot tube type example. It, and so the two things to remember is one, anytime connected water, you have connected water, you can write the energy equation. Energy at one is equal to energy at two plus head losses. This sample, for the pitot tube, I guess you'd have to think of this. If you have a pitot tube, this velocity right here is zero. It's that stagnation point. It's such a small device, we neglect head losses. And so then you can write your energy equation. This is open to the atmosphere. Everything else works out. You can calculate the pressure in the pipe. Does that make sense? All right. If I have a pump, so let me do something with the pump. I have a, all right, let's just call, I could leave it like that. Um, this is gonna be point two, this is gonna be point one. Uh, P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G. I put it on this side, H pump is equal to P2 over gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G plus head loss. So the idea is that you have energy, so maybe it was here. My energy grade line, energy grade line, which is this stuff, whoop, not the pump. I add energy from my pump, and then I have my energy grade line over here. So this would be H pump. I added X number of feet um, with my pump. The energy, if the, the energy grade line, I didn't, let me draw a little better. This is perfectly straight. This is my, uh, well, I guess this would be my energy grade. Uh, no, let's keep it. That would, I don't want to call it energy grade line because I would include it down there. Uh, this is going to be my energy grade line. Uh, this is head loss. So typically, I don't remember seeing one where you had to draw the energy grade line, but the energy grade line is P, Z, V, pressure, velocity, and elevation. You draw those, you add those three values together and draw those lines through a system, that's what we call the energy grade line. That's your energy. If you have a pump, you add energy, so it moves up your energy grade line. This is typically sloped because you have a head loss. So as you go along a pipe, you're losing energy, so your energy grade line's going down. Um, all right. Oh, and this is a useful relationship. Horsepower, so that's not this, this is horsepower, is equal to specific weight of water, the flow rate, H pump, divided by 550. Um, and I gave you the conversion if you happen to be in kilowatts. And so again, if, if you have a situation Let's say if this was 100 feet, if you have a pump that lifts the water 100 feet and you wanted to know sort of what horsepower that took, you could plug in the 100 feet here, the specific weight of water, and whatever your flow rate is. Um, I don't know, some number of, uh, this is cubic feet per second, so let's call it 10 cubic feet per second. 
You plug in all those numbers, you can calculate the horsepower required to do that. So if you've got to lift water 100 feet up to a reservoir or something like that, that's the equation you would use to calculate the horsepower to do that. Um, and then I guess you could, there are some questions, the efficiency of your pump is equal to P out over P in. So a pump is going to put out a certain horsepower, a certain amount of energy, right? So there's energy that goes into the pump. Um, oh, let me rewrite this. P in times N is equal to P out. I just want to make sure you think about it. This, this is what we want the pump to do. So you... If you use the energy equation and you calculate this term, that's what you need the pump to deliver to the water, right? So there are some simple questions. This might be more like an AM question. They might say something or give you something to, to solve this or somehow you know, okay, based on my energy equation, I need H pump to be 100 feet. Okay, if I come down to this equation, either of these, that's the P out. I need 100 feet from the pump. Your pump might only be 80% efficient. So you're going to need more horse, like the motor is going to provide more than 100 feet of horsepower, 100 feet of energy. The motor is going to provide, you know, this would be, you know, uh, P in would be, let's say it was 100 feet and our efficiency was 0.8, you know, P in would be whatever that is. It would be 100 and whatever feet. Um, so this equation is useful. This is always what you want. This would be what you would need from the motor. And this would be one um, for the water. And again, the efficiencies, they, they vary but with pumps. And if you have, they might give you a curve or a table or something, or just tell you what the efficiency of the pump is. Um, all right. All right, another thing, this will definitely get you a couple questions. Just remember the continuity equation. Q1 equals Q2 equals, uh, well, I could just, let's say this Q1 equals Q2. Q1 equals V1 A1 equals V2 A2. So this remember, Q equals V times A. So if I've got a pipe, there is a cross-sectional area and a velocity. The velocity times the area of the pipe, that's your discharge. And if I've got a, um, a pipe, and I look at one, and two, unless you, well, even if I change, I, I mean, I could do this. Q1 is equal to Q2. Q1 is equal to Q2. Q1 will always be equal to Q2 along a pipe unless you're taking out water. The Q can't change on you. That's our continuity equation. Q is always Q along the pipe unless you add or take out water. Now, Q is V1A1, V2A2. So here, I have a velocity, V1. Over here, is V2 bigger or smaller than V1? It's got to be smaller because my area got bigger. So if you make a pipe bigger, the velocity goes down, area goes up. You make the pipe smaller, velocity goes up, area goes down. It's all conserved. So a lot of the, the sort of the more simple problems, they kind of rely on continuity equation and give you, maybe they give you more, maybe not this one, but something like this, where they give you the velocity at two, um, 
We will do a problem with that. We give you velocity at one of these locations and something else at one of these locations, and you have to sort of rework this equation sort of in this form, and eventually you can solve for whatever V they didn't give you. They'll give you maybe both diameters or one velocity. They actually calculate the other velocity. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what I usually see is they'll give you one velocity, both areas and one velocity, then you've got to calculate the other velocity just with the continuity equation. So, if, so the one packet of sample problems, it's kind of nice. It has little hints when you look at actually where the problem's written. There's a hint at the bottom of every problem, and it says like continuity equation, energy equation, um, equivalent length diameter, um, energy and continuity. Or, so the, the, at the very beginning of the packet, these first sets of problems kind of have a little hint at the bottom. If you go to the solution, um, when it says continuity, you're going to see that kind of stuff. All right. Oh, and here's another one then. We can also say, because of continuity, one, two, three, I know that Q1 is equal to Q2 plus Q3. Assuming everything is flowing that way. And again, something like this, they'll give you enough that you can figure out Q2. Like you could, you're going to have to solve that a problem. Um, they'll give you a bunch of stuff, and they're going to ask you for Q2. They're not going to give you Q2. They're going to give you just enough to solve for Q2. Um, all right, we'll do one of those problems. All right. I don't want to get too much into the, the forces aspect of the hydraulics. I'm just going to do um, uh, one thing on forces. Well, two things, I guess. If I have this scenario, if this is water and this is a wall or a gate or something like that, there's a force vertical and a hor there's a horizontal and vertical force on that gate or wall or tank bottom, whatever it is. The horizontal force is gamma HC A horizontal, and the vertical force is gamma volume above. And what I mean by that is if, if I'm looking at so I'm, I'm, I'm in the water, I'm looking at the wall. What do I see? I see, I see a vertical wall, right? If, if, even though it's slanted, if I am in the water looking that way, my perspective, it looks like a flat surface to me. So I see this. I, I, I don't actually, you know, I, I can't tell how it's sloped. I just see a vertical face. So the horizontal force is, um, how do I want to do this? Well, let's just think of it like this. Because I'm only seeing H, this is what I have on the notes. I call this the projected plane, this dashed line. Uh, my area is Oh, how do I do it? H is just H times width. H sub C, and this is where it gets tricky. H sub C, which was here, and I have it written on, on the notes. It's the centroid of the vertical area to the water surface. Okay? So let me turn this and look into the board now. So if I'm looking at this, this is my water surface. I'm looking into the board. H sub C is H over 2. It's the centroid of that surface relative to the water surface. The centroid of that plane relative to the water surface. So it's this, just, I'm trying to think when does it, where can I make that more challenging? Oh, here's a good example. I don't think you're going to see this, but let's just do this. Uh, 
I'll make it a, f okay, I'll, I'll do a slanted wall. If I wanted to calculate the, the horizontal force on this segment, and let me, do, let's just say this is W, and this is 5. H sub C is the centroid of the projected surf, the projected plane relative to the water surface. So the centroid of my, my projected plane is W over 2 plus 5. It's the centroid relative to the water surface. So if you have this set up, it's just H over 2 like in this setup here. Over here, the water surface is way up here, so it's the centroid location relative to the water surface. That's what that note's supposed to mean. I've never seen them draw one of those. It's typically something basic like this, but just to, hopefully that makes it a little more clear. Um, and then this is a specific weight of water. For the vertical force in this scenario, You know, we have a triangle into the board some distance. You've got to calculate the volume. It's the volume above the plane. So it's that triangle into the board. Calculate the volume. Volume times specific weight. Think of it it's like the weight of the water, just the weight of the water. The horizontal is, um, without getting into all the fluid mechanics, it's, it's, it's due to the pressure prism, which is a function of the depth, and it works out to be this equation. So my, the only point with forces, I'm not going to do a lot with forces. If you keep it simple, the calculations are pretty simple. This is the horizontal force. This is the vertical force. The only thing challenging in the vertical force is calculating the volume. It's essentially a geometry problem. And if you know your dimensions, you can calculate the volume. This is specific weight of water. The horizontal force, the only thing that's challenging is making sure you're using this area, not the sloped flat, you know, th you know, the area of this plane is bigger than the area of this plane, right? You need to use the projected vertical plane, not the area of the slanted plane. So area can be a little tricky to get, and then just make sure H sub C is the center of that projected area, this point right here, relative to wherever the water surface is. So again, they could give you some geometry that's a little messed up, more like this, than something as simple as I did over here. These are the only two equations. And the resultant force is the horizontal force squared plus the vertical squared square root. So you could, I could calculate the resultant force. Pretty simple. Um, so you have that note. And then the momentum, again, I'm not going to get into momentum. Uh, the equations for the momentum problems, you know, I just, again, that's more of an afternoon thing. Um, if you're doing the afternoon session for, for water, go through the, the ones I gave you. The, it's just a little bit more involved calculation. Um, momentum, the sum of the forces is equal to rho Q V out minus V in, it's a vector, and I like to write it like this. Uh, rho Q out V out as a vector minus rho Q in V in as a vector. So the sum of the forces is going to be, you know, vector-based. And then this is the momentum side. And so what I'm meaning by... In this equation, Q in and Q out is the same. So if I'm trying to calculate the forces on this bend, you know, we could get into maybe something's holding the bend or whatever. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to get into how we set up all the forces.
But there are forces involved here. The momentum is this side. And what I just want you to make sure you pay attention to these vectors. Q in and Q out are the same. That's fine. That's easy. But in this equation, if, if this is positive x, V in is positive, V out is negative. So up here, I would have a negative velocity minus a positive velocity. So my momentum is going to be, this side of the equation is going to be a negative value. Does that make sense? Um, hey, I don't want to get too much more in there. Right? So that's what I'm talking about, the vectors. I didn't have a little diagram here. This can be, you know, these can be positive or negative depending on the geometry you have. So I know I could do, in this case, I could calculate a force balance for this fitting. If this occurred, v in, is V in bigger or smaller than V out? V out, V in is smaller. In, and if this is positive x, they're both positive. So I have a positive number minus a positive number, but v out is larger than v in. So my momentum, I'm going to have a positive number on this side of the equation. If I flip it, they will both be positive. Let's do it this way. Depending on how I draw it, maybe they're both negative. So V out is negative, V in is negative, because this is positive X. My velocity are going this way. Um, actually, let me make this out. This in. But now V in is larger than V out. So it's negative minus a negative, which makes that a positive. And now this side of the equation is positive. If it's going the other way, this side of the equation is negative which gets into the, how you figure out the, ho the forces to hold the fittings and stuff like that. And I don't want to do lots of examples. We could sp I spend a big chunk of my fluid mechanics semester just doing this equation here. I, we just don't have time. Um, so try to find some equations, that, some problems that talk about momentum, and just try to get familiar with what they're doing in the solutions. The thing I just want to make sure you get is that these are, so again, I'm going back to what students make mistakes in, in our exams when we do these sort of more like the afternoon questions. They get the positive negative signs wrong in the velocity vectors. They don't think about, you know, positive and negative because they don't, just don't think that way. So just make sure you pay attention to velocity, positives and negatives. Um, and V in and V out aren't always the same. Sometimes... You know, you have two V ins, so V out's bigger, or Q. Uh, Q in one, Q in two, Q out. Q out would be, you'd have two on this side. All right, that's all I want to say about momentum. All right. And I, so I gave you my notes. My problems I got from the sample exams, morning and afternoon, and the solutions. Uh, someone used to teach this. I've taught this for a couple years now, like maybe three years. The person who used to teach this class gave me his notes. And that's what you, you have these in your packet somewhere, correct? You should. In, in the PDFs, maybe it's just all in there somewhere. His notes were very heavy on the forces and the momentum stuff. Um, so you've got some sample problems that are a little more detailed, that are more detailed than you will see in the exam. Um, but that's how he used to do the review session. Um, I might not have given you the cover sheet. But you probably, this problem, you have the solution to this problem. These are all like force type calculation problems that we're, I'm not going to do. But you have some extra review material for those. Um, all right, how are we doing on time? All right. All right. Um.
uh, pipe, for, let's uh, talk about friction for a second. Pipe friction. Uh, we have Darcy Weisbeck equation that head loss due to friction is equal to a friction factor um, times L over D, V squared over 2G. So the head loss due to friction with the Darcy Weisbeck equation is F length of pipe divided by diameter pipe times the velocity head squared. So this is always going to be our velocity head. So the only challenge with the darcy Weisbach equation is F. You have to get F. Um, did I give you, um, well, let me just, F is a function of Reynolds number and this is a pipe roughness. And this is the diameter. So I think I gave you a Moody's diagram. You have a Moody's diagram. So you have got this figure where we have Reynolds number down here, uh, E over D on this side, and F's over here. And the curves are doing you know things like this. There, in a, depending on your reference equation or reference book, Maybe just write this down and double check this equation. Cole Brook White equation. There's too many things in it, and I don't want to write it down. Just my writing's terrible. There's lots of different numbers. This might be something you would like to, to look for. It's an equation form of that Moody diagram. So instead of having to use the figure and reading the figure, you can plug into equation um, if you go get that equation. Uh, if you use the diagram, which is not bad, it's a quick way to go. The equation can be complicated to calculate. Just, it's lots of stuff to plug in. I just want to make sure you remember, well, how many of you remember the Moody diagram? I mean, so it's, the only time you would have seen it is probably fluid mechanics class, maybe the FE review, maybe. Um, this is the one thing with the Moody diagram. If you know your E over D, you, the little E epsilon, you get that from a table based on your pipe type, concrete, steel, whatever. There's a table. You need a table that tells you what the little E is. You know the diameter of the pipe, so you can calculate E over D. Reynolds number. is diameter, velocity over, um, this is the kinematic um, viscosity, which you would need to get from a table. This is the viscosity. So let's say, okay, you can calculate RE. So we calculate RE, we calculate little e over d. I, let me move RE over here. So this is where, again, I'm just, showing, just trying to think of the things where, that could mess you up. These problems are simple if you have all the numbers. There's just subtle things that kind of make them a little challenging. The Moody diagram, the one thing that's challenging about that funky figure is the way you read it. So E over D is right here, which means you're between these two lines. Let's say we're in the middle. Reynolds number's over here. I'm trying to get to F. You see how there's a curve to those two lines? You maintain that spacing. You come up with your Reynolds number and then go over to your F. Again, the, the default thing for lots of people to do is to kind of go here, go here, go here, and it's kind of like reading e, e over D straight across. You maintain the spacing, you find your Reynolds number, and you go over and get F. Or Again, you look at this equation, it's something you can just calculate directly. It's just a bigger calculation. Uh, what else? That's from the Moody diagram. Hayes and Williams, another equation.
HF is 3.022, V to the 1.85, C to the 1.85, D to the 1.17, oh, and there's an L in here. This is from a table for the pipe type. You have to know your diameter, you have to know your velocity, and you have to know your L. Um, and again, you just need tables for Hayes and William coefficients, or you need the Moody diagram to figure out your F for your friction factor. And the problem will kind of, you know, what I've seen for the, from the sample problems, they will give you the Darcy Weisbeck F, or they'll give you this, and enough to calculate this other stuff, so you can use Moody to get F. Or if they're thinking you're going to go with Hayes and William, they may give you the C. Your pipe is a certain type, and they actually give you the C right in the problem. It's probably set up to go with Hayes and Williams at that point. So just pay attention. If they're giving you a Hayes and William coefficient, or a, they don't, maybe they don't even tell you. Maybe they just say you have a concrete pipe, and in brackets they have C equals 110. That's if you look at the table, that's kind of a Hazen Williams C coefficient. Um, or they're going to give you something with Darcy. Or we could do Mannings, which is HF is N squared Q squared L over 2.22A squared R to the 0 0.667. This is rough. This is Manning's roughness. That's your flow. That's your length. That's cross section area. This is hydraulic radius. Is area over wetted perimeter. We'll do more with hydraulic radius in a little bit. Um, and again, if they don't, I I, I saw. I've seen some all of the problems kind of set up a certain way. Again, I think if they're giving you a Manning's roughness and something that you could figure out what the hydraulic radius is, so you know the diameter, so you know area, you know wetted perimeter if you know the shape. So if it's flowing full, you know the area. Um, if you know the shape and it's flowing full, you, you can calculate hydraulic roughness or hydraulic radius. You have area, you have Q, you have L. You know, if they give you a Manning's roughness, you're probably going to use the Manning's equation to calculate the head loss. Um, what else? That's head loss. This is pipe friction. And then the minor losses. And again, this is where you really need tables to pull all these coefficients off of. The minor losses is HM is equal to summation of K V squared over 2G. And K is a uh, coefficient for uh, whatever it is you're looking at. So if you have, in the way the minor losses work, let's say we have a uh, pipe. We have a 90 degree bend, a 90 degree bend, some sort of valve, 90 degree bend, something like that. Okay, so you have one, two, three, four 90 degree bends. And let's say this is some sort of valve, they're gonna tell you what it is. There are tables that have K values for 90 degree bends, for whatever pipe you have. K values for whatever valves you have. So it would be a table with K values for all these pipe fittings. You just go through here, okay, so I sum up one, two, three, four, so four times K. If my diameter is the same, my velocity is the same, you're just solving this equation. You're summing up all of these K times the velocity head. So think of it, you have a velocity going through a fitting. The velocity gives you V squared over 2G. V squared over 2G, 2G times K for that fitting, plus the velocity head times K for the next fitting plus the velocity head times k for the next fitting. And so you're just adding little bits of head loss, which is why we call it minor losses, for all these little things you encounter. 
So this is what we use for minor losses. This is these three equations that I had are what we use for friction. So when you have a, so this is another hint. If the problem says you have a very long pipe, this will dominate the head loss. You typically can neglect minor losses. Or if they don't tell you anything about your pipe network, you have no idea if there's bends, you have no idea if there's valves, you're going to neglect minor losses. The problem that starts with you have seven 90 degree bends and two something valves and this and that, you're going to have to calculate minor losses. Um, they're going to have to give you specifics on number of bends, number of 45 degree bends, number of 90 degree bends, types of valves, it, or T's, like going through a T, um, you have a minor loss. Going through a T and coming out the side, you have a bigger minor loss. Um, so if they're telling you that kind of stuff, you're going to be solving this equation at some point to calculate the minor losses. Um, and if, again, if they don't give you that, you're just going to do the friction loss. Or if they tell you I have a very long pipe, you can pretty much neglect the minor losses because this number will be much, much, much bigger than the minor losses. Um, all right. Pipes in parallel. I don't really want to. Branch networks, that's too. We don't have time to get into those. Oh, I guess I will. You might be able to do this um, without spending too much time on it. Just one, if I have something that looks like this, this is Q, Q1, Q2, I have Q again. I know, and let's say water's going this way. I know that Q equals Q1 plus Q2. Con continuity. There's no way Q doesn't equal Q1 plus Q2. It's split. Your flow split and joined up again. This is what is pretty nice. I know, let's call this, uh, well, what my notes say, the head loss along this side and the head loss along this side are equal. And the way, well, this is, I used to do hydraulic grade lines through water and wastewater treatment plants, and this actually works really well. And it's the way you could get, get away with it. If I split flow into two pipes, and one pipe is 100 feet longer than the other pipe, it's, well, it's, it's really hard to sort of split the flow hydraulically at that point. Because what you're actually doing, the flow will adjust itself until the energy loss is the same in both pipes. That's what's getting balanced. The flow doesn't split. The energy splits. So whatever energy goes that way, whatever energy loss goes that way, the, the loss of energy is balanced between the two. Because if you have more flow going over here, you're going to have higher head loss, right? So what's going to happen is it's going to be easier for water to go the other way. So some of the water will start going the other way which will slow this velocity down, reduce this head loss, increase that head loss. And it kind of goes back and forth until it stabilizes. The head loss on the two sides is exactly the same. So you can have a really long pipe and a really short pipe, but you could actually design it that the head loss is the same. So the flow will be the same. Like you can design the flow split based on how you design the pipes for the head loss. So you actually use the head loss to split the flow. Um, and it, it does work. Um, and so there are a couple simple problems where you have to know the head loss along both is the same, and they're giving you just enough information that, that you could, with that assumption, you can then solve the problem in terms of, you know, there's various scenarios what they're giving, with, giving you, but if you don't remember the head loss on these two is equal, you can't solve that problem. Um, so if you see a pipe that's split and they talk about head loss, Instantly know you can apply that head loss value to both sides. Um, all right. Uh, all right. All right, just a couple things on pumps. All right, we're almost done and then we'll do problems. Um, All right, pumps, 
System curves, so here's a pump, here's a pump curve, here's a system curve, this is the operating point. So this is the pump curve, this is the system, this is a head, this is Q. So again, you turn on a pump, when the, when the pump is subjected or putting out a, a high head, the flow is relatively small. As you increase the flow rate, the, the head the, that corresponds to that flow rate decreases. So your pump curves typically look something like this. Your system curve, as flow increases, the, the, the head loss in your system increases. So your system curves look like this. This is your static head. So that's something like, let's say you have a pump that's here, and maybe a pump's here, and my water's elevation's here, the pump's on the floor. I've got a tank with a pump on the side. I've got this elevation of water, and I'm pumping to this elevation. At zero flow, I have a static head. I need to get water from here to here. I have no flow until I have at least sort of that much head generated. That's what this number would typically be. And then, once you overcome the static head, head loss increases with uh, increasing discharge. Where these two curves intersect is your operating point. Right there. So again, if you turn this on, you turn your pump on at a constant rate, it's gonna go over and your system curve velocity will start to increase, it'll actually find that point on its own. It'll stabilize and it'll lock in on that location. Um, unless you change the velocity of the, the speed of the pump, it's, it stays right there. Um, the only th two things I want to talk about pumps, just remember we have pumps in series, which means, um, I didn't draw all these. So series would be, I have a pipe and a pump, pumping into a pipe and pumping back into a pump. So I pump from a pump into a pump. So here, if I looked at my system curves, I have this and I have, well, let me not do that. This is what my drawing means. I'm drawing this really bad, but. With one pump on, I get that head for a given discharge. With two pumps on, I get that head for a given discharge. So when they're in series, I'm going to say H2 is 2H1 if the pumps are... You're basically doubling the head. I don't know how you want to remember that. In series, you're, you're increasing the head for a given discharge. So think of... Does anyone work with well, wells? Well pumps or anything like that? So with wells, what they end up doing is they have a, lot, a bunch of little pumps that are kind of like in a, in a column, and they just pump into each other. So, you know, a pump doesn't put out that much head. I mean, I mean, some pumps can, but some wells are really deep. So if you put a whole bunch of little pumps on top of each other, you pump into a pump, into a pump, pump into a pump, you can just rapidly increase the head output of the pumps for a given flow rate. Um, so you're just pumping in, and then you're, the flow, and this is what maybe will help. The flow can't change. I can't change the flow through pumps in series. This pump and this pump have to have the same flow because I can't change flow. It's, I have continuity to worry about. But what I can do is I can increase the head with additional pumps. My flow rate stays the same. Pumps in parallel, so now I have this. That's parallel pumps my curve would look like this. I have one pump curve, and then I have two pump curves. So for a given head, Q1, Q2. So if I have one pump on, I get Q1 for a given head. If I turn on the second pump, I double my flow for a given head, if, assuming they're the same pumps. So pumps in parallel, you're, you're keeping the head constant and changing the flow. Pumps in series, you're keeping the flow constant and you're changing the head. 
Does that make sense? Um, so you might see some of those. And the last thing you do typically see is a NPSHA, net positive suction head and then available suction head. Any, any remember that, NPSH? And so the idea here is if you have water and you have a pump that's up here somewhere, you're, you're going to suck the water up into the pump. You physically, there's a limit to how much you can suck based on the jump, like based on how the pump inside is designed. And what will happen is if you try to suck too much, like you generate too much of a suction, you'll take the water out of a liquid phase and put it, some of it into a gas phase, it'll make little bubbles, and your pump will cavitate. And it depends on the geometry of inside the pump, and you, you could never calculate what that number should be for a pump. The manufacturer has to tell you that. And so they give you a curve, NP, they'll give you this NPSH curve that's a function of the, 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 the flow rate. And so with NPSH, um, We'll say NPSH available has to be greater than NPSH um, required, and this is from the pump manufacturer. <coughs> and NPSHA, NPSHA is equal to P atmosphere minus P vapor. over specific weight of water minus delta Z plus head loss. And um, this is HF plus HM potentially. And so what we have here is my delta Z. And these, this is the thing that's tricky. This is absolute pressure. So I saw one of the problems, maybe we'll have time to get to it. It's a pretty simple problem if you have a table that gives you atmospheric pressure. And this is vapor pressure of water. Vapor pressure of water. This is atmospheric pressure. And so the problem that I'm thinking about, one of the ones in the handout, they give you the altitude of a location. It's like 5,000 feet above sea level. And I think that's all you need to get atmospheric pressure from a table. Get 5,000 feet above sea level. There's, I have a table in my fluid mechanics book. Atmospheric pressure, I have the number. They tell you the air temperature is 55 degrees. I have a table in my fluid mechanics book. 55 degrees, the vapor pressure of, of water is, I have the number. This is just pulling numbers from a table. You're actually solving this problem for delta Z. They give you this, and they give you this. Um, so it's a pretty, you know, if you have the tables and you know, okay, I can look up atmospheric pressure as a function of elevation. I can look up vapor pressure as a function of temperature. Um, this actually, the way they did it, is they gave you a NPSHA. Um, I think it was just NPSH, as a function of Q, and they told you the Q. And so you had a, I forget which way the curve was going. Anyway, you could come up and over and you can get the NPSH. So you had this from a figure, you looked up those, they gave you the head loss, you had to calculate delta Z. So NPS, some of the problem, I mean, NPSH problems can get more complicated, but a lot of the times, not a lot of times, several times, I've seen them where you're really just solving for delta Z in that equation. And they, maybe they ask you something about elevate, like they'll give you elevation of the water, or they'll give you elevation of the pump. You calculate delta Z, and then now you can calculate the elevation of the pump or the elevation of the water. So what elevation would the, could the pump be, or what elevation would the water be if you know, this was the condition? So there's two things you have to remember on these problems. You have to have, somehow you have to know 
the net positive suction head required for your pump at a particular flow rate. You have to know that from the manufacturer, and they give that to you in these problems. You can calculate NPSHA with this equation. The only thing you, you know, you're either going to have to solve for the head loss or solve for delta Z unless they give all that to you. This stuff you're going to look up in a table. Um, so they, these problems can sound, count, that's the only reason I'm really highlighting it. Problems can sound complicated, and when you look at some of the equations, it looks complicated. But these problems actually work out to be pretty basic um, when you get to the actual application in the exam. Um, all right. I'm not going to go through these, but there's also affinity laws. Just spend a couple minutes getting familiar with some of these equations. What the affinities laws do, um, it's all ratio based. So does anyone work with pumps ever? So I used to work with pumps all the time. The challenge is and that's where these affinity laws come into play. You have a very specific condition that you want your pump to do. Manufacturers don't manufacture every possible combination of impeller diameter, RPM of motor. You just can't get all these combinations. So what you can do is you can use these affinity laws to say, okay, uh, if I have, I want flow one, uh, like a, there's a flow ratio, Q1 over Q2 is N1 over N2 is D1 over D2. So the ratio of the RPMs, the ratio over the impeller diameters is the ratio over Q. So depending on maybe what you can get from the manufacturer that's giving you RPM and diameter um, and what they say the flow would be, you could then calculate a new RPM or a new diameter impeller for a flow that you might want. So there's you know, it's just a bunch of ratios that allow you to go from pump one has this diameter, this impeller uh, RPM, and uh, this flow rate. You know, pump two is a different diameter, a different RPM, a different flow rate. And they're all sort of these ratios back and forth. So you can look at ratios of impeller diameter, RPM um, for discharge, pressure, and power. And, you know, basically custom build a pump with these affinity laws. Um, and so the problems for these are pretty straightforward. They give you essentially all but one of these variables, and you solve for the other one. Just kind of have to remember affinity laws, a bunch of ratios. Are they asking for flow, power, or pressure? And you know which law to use. Um, oh, and the other one I'm not going to get into, specific speed. Again, it's a pretty simple equation. I wrote all the units and stuff on there. I've seen a couple simple calculations. They give you basically everything. You're just solving that one equation. So, again, if you have this specific speed equation, there's not a lot they do with it. They just ask you to solve it. Um, all right. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into all the hydraulic jumps and everything. I just want you to know that if you have, if there's a question on a hydraulic jump, I didn't even give them to you, did I? I guess I gave you some, but you should just have these. Um, if you have a jump, let's uh, do D1 and D2. There are equations that you can, if they give you D1 and say the flow rate or something like that, you can calculate D2 with some of these equations. So there are equations that allow you to go back and forth between D1 and D2. You just need a velocity, D1 or D2. And then you can calculate, like, so if you have D1 and V1, you can calculate D2. And then if you have D2, you can calculate V2 because of continuity. So this is just a hydraulic jump, and there are equations that allow you to calculate stuff on one side versus the other side. Um, all right, so then Froude number, is V square root of G DH. And I just want you to know DH is area over top width. There's, it gets more complicated. Um, fruit number less than one is subcritical. Fruit number greater than one is critical. And then 
dH is what we call the hydraulic depth. So if I have a rectangle, what's A over D? What's A over top width for a rectangle? It's the depth, right? The area divided by the top width for a rectangle is the depth of water. If you don't have a rectangle, but you have the area, so I have area of a triangle, if I know this area and I know this top width, I can plug it in, I get my dH, I can put dH in here and I can calculate my fruit number. So sometimes you see the equations for any shape, they look a little different. And sometimes you see the equations for a, just a rectangle and they have just D, like depth. I just want you to make sure you note that this is dH, which is area divided by top width. This will work for any shape cross section. If you know the cross sectional area and know the top width, calculate dH, plug it in, you get your fruit number. And where you might use Froude number is if they're asking something about critical or subcritical flow. If Froude number is greater than one, it's critical flow. If it's less than one, it's subcritical flow. Or it's not critical, this is super. Equal one is critical, greater than one is supercritical. Um, it's, so it's just a, a number that they use to talk about you know, states of water flow. Um, and the problems I've seen, I think you're, you're basically usually solving for fruit number or something like that. So you're just solving that equation somehow. Um, and then Manning's equation for the open channel flow stuff. Uh, Manning's. Uh, so V equals 1.49 N hydraulic radius to the two-thirds, S to the one-half. Q equals VA. So sometimes you see this with an A in it, and it's Q instead of velocity. Um, hydraulic radius, remember, is area over the wetted perimeter. And slope is the slope in feet per feet. Uh, and just one assumption I have, if they ever ask you for normal depth or something normal, this is the key word. If there's normal depth, normal velocity, normal, normal, what else could they ask you for? I guess they could ask you for depth, velocity, or discharge. What is the normal depth? What is the normal velocity? What is the normal discharge? All that means is S is equal to S naught, which is the bed slope. So if you, so Manning's equation, is, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's an empirical relationship. But if you put the water surface slope in the Manning's equation, it gives you a really good discharge. We actually don't, if you ever use Manning's equation, hardly ever do you know the water surface slope. We put in the bed slope. We put in the slope of the bottom of the channel. When you put in the bottom of the channel slope and not the water slope, that's what we call normal depth, normal velocity, normal discharge. It's, we're making this assumption. So some of the problems, they're asked, don't, so if they ask you for normal depth, just remember it's Manning's equation and use the bed slope for the slope. If they ask you for normal velocity, it's Manning's equation using the bed slope for slope. Um, they may not say anything about what it is, they might just say, what is the normal depth? You instantly should go, oh, I gotta solve Manning's equation, and they're gonna, you know, you're gonna have something to calculate the bed slope. Uh, the water what's that? Surface. The water surface slope? Does it slope? Yeah. yeah, so that's where, you know, so if it, here's your channel, you know, the water surface could slope like that, or like that, which is different than the bed slope. And so if I plug in this slope to Manning's equation, I get one answer. If I plug in that slope to Manning's equation, I get a different answer. And if I plug in that slope to Manning's equation, I get a different answer. And these are all possible scenarios for, for actually the same discharge. I could have this too, right? I could have a normal. Uh, so it has to do with momentum and other things, and it gets into more dynamics than, like this is more steady state. But uh, when you really see it as uh, at the beginning of us, like on the rising side of a hydrograph, 
your water's typically like the waves behind you, so the water's like steeper, and then after the high, the peak goes by, the water tends to get less steep, and like you're on the backside of the waves. So literally, a wave goes down these rivers, and so the slope of the water pivots a little bit around what you'd call the bed slope. But it's hard to measure. We'd never. It's really hard to know what that would be without physically measuring it. So most of the time, we just use the bed slope. Um, all right. There's stuff about, you know, if you're doing the afternoon, I have something on there about calculating water surface elevation between two channels. This is definitely a more involved problem that you're going to have to uh, look at some of the practice problems. It's just it's a bigger calculation. Um, I'll give you a little bit of notes on that. Um, what else? I give you some, so on culverts, I've also given you, um, I gave you a hand, so I gave you some tables on C, I gave you some minor losses, I give you some stuff on culverts, and this, the, the, for culverts, I just want you to really take a look at this table, and whatever reference book you have might have more tables, and so the way we do culvert design, it's kind of, I don't want to say cookbooky, but you have a setup. So this, the one figure that I gave you, I have a type one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's about all you see is six, six types. I want to think there, there are, a, there's a seven and eight. Some reference tables have a seven and eight. But you see in this schematic, there are various combinations of uh, the water being above the front of the culvert and below or above the culvert outlet. And so you have all these combinations of, is your inlet flooded, which means the water's above the inlet, or is it below the inlet elevation so it's not flooded at the entrance? Is the outlet flooded or not flooded? And so these pictures kind of walk you through different combinations of how a culvert could function. And the problems that I've seen is kind of like interpreting these graphs. They tell you just enough that you can figure out what type of culvert scenario you have without actually having to size the culvert or anything like that. That gets too complicated, but they could ask you, show you something and say, is this, what type of culvert is this? Is this one, two, three, or four? So you just have to know that there's a table, a graphic that you can look at and you could probably figure out what type of culvert you have. And some reference manuals have better pictures of these. Does that make sense? Um, that's the only thing I've seen with culvert design. What type do you have? Is it a one, two, three, four? Um, and they give you just enough to figure it out. Um, and what else did I give you on culverts? I also gave you a couple equations for weirs. Um, there, there could be some simple weir equations, uh, especially in the morning session. Uh, there's a rectangular weir. I gave you a V-notch weir. I gave you a, an equation for a curb inlet for a gutter. Um, if you have a reference book, a hydraulics reference book, you may have three or four or five other equations for different types of weirs or sort of structures that could potentially pop up on the exam, then you, you, know, you could solve it with one of those equations. Uh, most of them are, you know, Q equals CLH to something. It's like a, a length of the weir or the width of the opening, a coefficient for that type of weir, and then the depth of water going over the weir. Um, uh, so I've given you a couple equations, and go through the examples and see what weirs they talk about in any of the sample problems. And if you have one of those, you're good. Uh, the orifice is another equation where it's uh, the, or the flow through an opening that's submerged is an orifice, and it's a C, like a coefficient for that opening, times the area of the opening times square root of GH, which is the height over the opening. Uh, and again, the simple, simple equation, and they're going to give you basically everything in the equation, you just have to know, oh, I have an equation I can use to calculate the flow through an orifice. Um, that'd be more like a morning question. Um, all right, any questions on this? I didn't want it, to, it's hard to do the, there's so much on hydraulics relative to hydrology. Hydrology's, you know, you're all here. We're, you have rainfall, you're gonna calculate runoff. And you got like two or three equations and that's it. And it's, the hydrology, I think, is pretty straightforward. You're going to do conservation of 
you, know, you can do water balance or convert units or something like that. Hydraulics is this, there's so many different equations and so many different tables with coefficients for the different table for the different equations that there's just a lot of different things to think about for the hydraulics versus the hydrology. Um, so I know I spent more time on the hydraulics, some of the background, but I think if you, if you take the time and go through the sample problems that I, I gave you, and maybe if you don't even solve them, but you just walk through and see what they asked and what, how they solved it, um, and where they got the numbers. So what, if you look on these, let's go to some of these now, like uh, problem one. So on this on the front page of my uh, exam now, the exam sample problems. Uh, problem one, water flows at 4.2 CFS in a two inch diameter pipe that is connected through a reducer to 1.5 inch diameter pipe. What is the velocity in the other pipe? They, so they're giving, I mean, you have a bigger pipe. Oh, my pen might be dead. You have a bit, bigger pipe going into a smaller pipe. I know Q1 equals Q2 and Q equals VA. They've given, and so V2, A2, one, one. They've given me one velocity in both A's. I gotta calculate the other, the velocity. It's just a continuity equation. So that's a really quick, straightforward question. Um, they've given me V, well, if this is my two inch pipe, right? I know this, I know this, I know this, I don't know that. You just solve that simple equation. Um, Question three is getting a little bit more um, interesting. So here they have a setup. Where I have uh, A, B, C. And I'll just, conceptually, I'll, I'll talk about this one. Water flowing in a Schedule 40 steel pipe divides at a T. So we have a funky T. Um, the characteristics, they've given us some stuff. The flow rate is pipe A. So here I know Q A is 0 0.76 cubic feet per second. Assume minor losses are negligible. What is the flow rate in pipe C? So just without even looking at the, you'll see there, there's a lot of problems that kind of build off of this one. How would you do this? I know, okay, so I know diameters. So I, I know A, 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 B, and A, C. I know P, A, pressure in A, and I know pressure in B. How would you solve this? So this is my go-to. If you don't, we want, we want stuff in pipe C. I don't, I don't know everything in pipe C. So this should always, if they give you any pipe setup, so this happens to be three pieces. A lot of times it's just two. It's like from here to here, from here to there. Always think about writing the energy equation. So. I can write my energy equation. Jeez, oh, all these pens. Are... All right. I can write my energy equation from he, from from A to B, and I can go from A to C. I can write two energy equations. I can always write the energy equation from one spot to another spot if I can swim there. Just think if you can swim there. Something could swim there. You can write the energy equation. So I could say uh, P1, no, PA over gamma plus ZA 
plus VA squared over 2G, we're, we're neglecting energy losses, is equal to PB over gamma plus ZB plus VB squared over 2G. All right, so there's a couple hints to this problem. And again, this, there's lots of problems that we're probably not going to, we won't get to. But always think about writing this energy equation. They told us to neglect losses, so I'm, I'm not putting the head loss in there. But this is a slight trick to this, and you'll see this quite often. Did they tell me anything about the, L I don't know the orientation of this pipe. It's a fitting. So I don't know if it's vertical, horizontal with, with C out the side or C out the bottom. I don't know any of that stuff. But we typically do center line elevations for pipes. And if it's a pipe and we're just talking about the edges of the fitting, like from here to here and here to here, that distance tends to be pretty small. Um, we have two inch pipe, one inch pipe. I, I mean, these are small values. So typically in this system, well, it doesn't matter, ZA and ZB, you probably, if they have something like this, assume ZA and ZB are the same. So they cancel. They've given me PA and PB. They have, I have it in, in gauge units. I've got to convert to uh, pounds per cubic foot. But I know A, I know B, and I know VA because they gave me QA. I can calculate VB. Everyone see that? I know everything to calculate VB. It's just a matter of plugging in numbers and converting units. They've given me pressure. They've given me pressure. They've given me discharge, which gives me velocity because I know the diameter. I can calculate the velocity in B. So VB is going to give me QB. And what do I know? I know QA is equal to Q, well, QC plus QB. That could be a little, that could be a little bit of a hang up. I mean, they do have a flow direction. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue that maybe water's coming in from C, which is changing B. You'd never be able to do the problem that way. Um, So maybe that could hang you up if you thought about it too much. But in this one, they showed you one flow direction, so think of water going that way and it's going to be splitting. It's, they would have had them show you another flow direction if it was coming in from C. So the idea is it's going out. I write my energy equation from A to B. I get QB. I come over here. I can solve for QC. But the point is, always think about writing that energy equation. If you don't know something, write the energy equation, and I bet you you can figure out what you don't know after you lay it all out and cancel some stuff. All right, what other one did I want to do? There's an affinity law on this one. Um, this write this down so the on the page two, number seven. I don't want to go through it, but look at the solution. Number seven looks. You know, you're right, read it, and it's going to look hard. Once you go to that solution in my notes, um, seven is a net positive suction question. They've given you everything. You're just plugging in some numbers in that equation I gave you. And I would work on seven just as an example of what you might see for net positive suction. Um, I have a couple others marked. Four, uh, well, open channel hydraulics. So we go in, there's four, there's one of those ones. Uh, the top of the page is 3 2. Question four is a, is a culvert type that is asking you what type of culvert you have. Um, a lot of these are just solving some basic equations. I want to get to one that's a little more interesting. Yeah, let's just look at this one. 20, 0, 2, 4. It's, it's like the, 
one, two, three, four. Like the fifth page in, there should be one that looks like this. Zero, two, four. It's a tank with a pipe slanted out the bottom. Um, water stored in a large reservoir. And we have a pipe coming down. Um, I have an elevation of my water. Water stored in a large reservoir. They give me the empties through a 24 inch, 24 inch pipe. Um, the far end of the pipe has an elevation, so I know, I know this elevation, I know this elevation. Uh, the discharge to the pipe is most likely what? So I have a L, I have a D, and I have an F. All right, so I, I want the discharge, so how am I going to get the discharge? Um, I don't know. So, again, what would you do on this one? They want to know what's the discharge out of the pipe. Energy equation. So I'm going to, and so this, the only thing with the energy equation that sometimes can be tricky is where, from where to where. In this case, I'm going to do it from the water surface. And I didn't draw this properly, but this is also, so the pipe discharges to the atmosphere, the way they've shown it. So I'm going to do one to two. So P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G is P2 over gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G plus head loss. All right. Um, Z1 and Z2, I've, I, I know. I've been given Z1 and Z2. So these I know. What can I do with P1 and P2? They're zero because they're open to the atmosphere. What's V1? Zero because it's a large tank. Anytime, even see it in the, this, always remember this as a little backup. A large tank. They're making it clear that's a large tank. That means the velocity of the water in the tank is zero. And they're going to say large tank almost all the time. All right, so. What don't I know in here? I don't know V2. I need V2 is my answer, isn't it? The only thing that makes this complicated is I don't know the head loss yet. All right, so head loss is F L D um, F L. What is what is that equation? I don't do this. What is it? F L over D V squared over two G L over D V squared over 2G. That's it, head loss. I know L, I know D, I know F. So head loss is a number times V squared over 2G. So Z1 minus Z2 is equal to a number V squared over 2G plus V squared over 2G. You just got to solve that for V. So that makes so here, the only thing I don't know in this equation is V. So I could take this and put it up in there, and the only unknown in that equation is V. You just have to solve that equation for the velocity, and then convert it to discharge because you know the diameter. And again, on all these problems, we could keep going on these problems, but. Anytime they give you a layout of a pipe network or a layout of a reservoir system or a layout of something for the hydraulic stuff, it's, unless it's a simple problem where you're calculating like Manning's equation in a, in a culvert cross-section or a river cross-section, you're at just one spot, you're just going to use a, one equation. If they give you something that's stretched out in space and they're saying water goes from here to here, always think about writing the energy equation. And maybe you have a pump, so you have to, I mean, there could be a pump, so we have an H pump on this side. 
But you write that equation out, you start dropping off the stuff you don't know, or you, don't, you, you know you know. Um, some things go to zero. For all the problems, basically once you walk through that, you're down to like one thing that you need, and that's what you just solve the equation for. But knowing to write the energy equation is your go-to. The only thing that can get a little challenging, like in this one, I mean, you, in this one, I guess the only thing that I would think, and I know students would do in my fluid mechanics class anyway, they wanted C, right? They would have written the energy equation from A to C, and they would have had too many unknowns. In this one, you had to sort of do two things. You had to go to here because you knew you could get the velocity and get discharge, and then you could write that continuity equation. And so knowing where to write the energy equation from where to where, that's, that's really the only thing that can get a little complicated when you have multiple paths. If it's one path, it's straightforward. From here to here, go to the open to the atmosphere so your pressures go away, write that equation, and then just solve for it. Um, I'm not going to do it, because we're, again, we're running out of time. But look at page 30, 039. It's a culvert. You just might have note that one. This is a really good example to look at the solution for it. It's a simple Manning's calculation. The problem with this problem, the, the challenge with this problem, a circular culvert of diameter 48 inches can, conveys water at a depth of 30 inches. The interior of the pipe is concrete, coated, blah, 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 has an end factor of 0 0.014. The velocity is most nearly what? They're giving you the elevation gradient. They're giving you the slope. They're giving you the shape of the culvert. They're giving you the elevation of water in the pipe. It's a simple Manning's calculation if you, figure, if you know the geometry of a pipe that's not full. It's not fully flowing, so it's like an open channel. There, if you go to the solution, there are tables. In the, I don't know what reference books you have, but there are tables that take circular pipe. And so here's a circular pipe. Ah, man, the pens are terrible. This is R. This is D. There's an R over D ratio for this problem. It's 30 over 48. It's 0 0.06 or something like that. If you go to a table, so what you end up doing on these problems, there's multiple problems like this in the practice exam. You're going to see it for sure. What you end up doing is you solve the problem like it's flowing full. Then you go to the table. Calculate your R over D. So we have 30 over 48. We get this ratio. We go to the table. We pull a number that's the discharge ratio. So it's like Q over Q full. So you assume 48 inches. Calculate Manning's equation. Calculate this ratio. Go to the table. Get this ratio. You've calculated this number. You can now solve for that number. It's a much simpler calculation than trying to solve for the geometry of a 30 inch. I mean, you've got the challenge is you need to know this. You need to know this area and this wetted perimeter. That geometry is not simple. It's much easier to just assume it's full, go to the table that's already been pre developed, and pull off this ratio, which gives you this ratio. And then you've solved for this, and now you can calculate the answer. There's several problems in the packet that I gave you that's doing that exact thing. You just need to have that table with you when you're in the exam so you can do that. So star that one and look at the solution for that one. Um, the next page over, 504, is a simple pitot tube problem like I, gave, I did the, in, on the board. Again, if you know the velocity is zero at the top of the, the pitot tube and the velocity is zero at the entrance of the pitot tube, it's a super simple problem. 
If you don't remember that, I don't know how you'd solve it. Um, so anytime you see that little pitot tube, know that the velocity right at the entrance is zero. Um, 505 is just energy equation. 506 is energy equation. 510 is Manning's equation. 511 is Manning's equation. Um, what was the other one I wanted to do? Let's skip that. There, a lot of these start to just repeat. They just change numbers. Um, again, here's a, this is AM problems. You were asking about AM problems. There's some hydraulic problems, specifically called out for anyone who's not taking the water section. And again, go through these, just look at, double check the solution. Some of these are very fast and very straightforward. Um, if you think about what we talked about today, uh, like the bottom 126. All right, this will be, I think it's have to be the last one. I've got to go. I made my boat by, it was like one minute last time. All right, so here's one, here's two. Assume Bernoulli's equation applies, ignore head losses. That means you've got the energy equation and we drop the head loss. Uh, which of the following statements is correct? The pressure head increases from one to two, pressure head decreases from one to two, pressure head remains unchanged from one to two. Bernoulli's equation does not include pressure head. All right, so it's not D because there's pressure head in Bernoulli's equation. So does the pressure head increase from one to two, decrease from one to two, or stay the same? Decreases. Why does it decrease? Why does the pressure head decrease from one to two? Velocity, velocity head increases. So ve velocity is faster. Velocity head's bigger. Energy equation means we have to account for the increase in V squared over 2G. The only way we can do that is a decrease in P over gamma. So pressure head decreases when velocity increases because Z stayed the same. So that's, again, it's, you can break these problems down into sort of two categories. You're going to do the energy equation through a system or your at a spot, a cross section, a pipe, a channel or something, and you're going to solve something related to Manning's equation or Hayes and Williams equation or something like that. Or they've given you a layout and they want you to calculate the head loss using like a Hayes and Williams equation, not necessarily the energy equation. Um, they've given you everything. You don't need to calculate the energy equation. They've given you everything you need to calculate the, the head loss. You're just calculating HF. Remember I gave you three equations for HF? They've given you all the stuff to calculate HF. You just got to go through and do it. Um, or you're writing the energy equation, trying to figure out a velocity or a discharge or something like that. Um, or you're doing something like Manning's equation for a, a cross section of some shape. Um, there may be questions related to what culvert design scenario do you have? Um, what uh, uh, culvert design? If you get into having to do forces and momentum, they just get more complicated. Well, I could just look through the practice exam and think about those. If you're doing the afternoon, um, look specifically for some force calculations. Um, I've given you some additional samples on forces, too. All right. I apologize. I've got to stop a little early, but I've got to get to uh, the last boat of the day. So again, like, like, just like I said before, if, you, if anything comes up, shoot me an email. If, if you have trouble figuring out why they did one of the solutions, I have not worked through all of these, but I could definitely take a look and like, work through it with you to figure out what they're, why they did whatever they did. Other than that, good luck.